Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? Good. Good. Good, good, thanks. Well, I am so glad um, to see you all. And thank you for joining us at our last presentation for the fall 2022 STEM Ed Speaker Series. I am delighted to have Dr. Richard Lamb joining us today. Um, for those of you that know me, I will tell you that I met him when I was in grad school. So we've known each other a while. Um, but let me introduce him and I'll let him take it away after that. Richard Lamb is a member of the Department of Special Education Foundations and Research and is currently the director of the Neurocognition Science Laboratory at East Carolina University. He earned his PhD from George Mason University College of Education and Human Development. His research focuses on the identification of cognitive markers of learning, increasing efficacy and performance of neural processing and cognition during learning using novel technologies and educational environments. A second area of related research is in the use of psychophysio measurement tools and virtu virtual and synthetic environments to provide access to learning opportunities and assessment of mental status and socio-emotional health interventions for students in high-need schools in rural and underserved locations. Using advanced technologies, he seeks to shape the biophysiosocial aspects of learning and mental health to promote learning and well-being across the lifespan. That is amazing. So welcome, uh, Dr. Lamb. We're excited to hear from you today. Thank you very much. I had to make sure I hit all the buzzwords for everything, you know. <laughs> that so. one is mouthful. I love it. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm going to, if, if it's okay with you, Rachel, I'm going to try to share. And if you could just let me know if it's everyone easy. can see everything, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? You're good. Okay, perfect. Just get my timer going and then we'll go from there. All right, so hi everyone. Uh, thank you for attending, I appreciate it. Um, I'm surprised at the number of people that are, are here, so thank you. I, I'm grateful for that. Uh, my name is Richard Lamb, and I'm the director of the Neurocognition Science Laboratory at East Carolina University. And today we're going to talk about neurocognitive techniques, a little bit of machine learning, and sort of how, at least in my understanding of the world, I look at what I call product and process data in STEM education research. So before we get into it, I'll tell you a little bit about me and a little bit about the lab. I uh, have to plug the lab, I, I feel obligated. Um, so my background actually came out of science education and had a, a bachelor's of science in biochemistry. Uh, after that, I was commissioned into the United States Army uh, as a member of the military intelligence corps, came out and sort of wanted to think about what I was doing with my life. And I got interested in education. I had the opportunity in the army to teach. And I thought, you know, teaching was a lot of fun. I had a blast doing it. So became a teacher through a lateral entry program. I decided that I wasn't paid enough as a teacher with a bachelor's degree. Went back and got my master's of science in science education and educational technology. That was a blast. So I decided to go back and uh, go get my doctorate in science education and measurement, and then became an assistant professor, then an associate professor, and then uh, moved to ECU. And I am a professor, supposedly a professor of social science research methods, um, you know, whatever that means. And then I'm also in the process of working on a master's of science in clinical mental health counseling as my work has moved more into some looking at some of the socio emotional aspects of it. And I thought that a, a background in a little bit of clin clinical mental health counseling would be helpful. So to sort of give you a little bit of a background about the lab itself, there's really three main research groups within the lab. And so the lab sits kind of at the center of what I call digital mental health and behavioral research. So we work with um, students with neurodevelopmental differences and do mental health work with the families and then also applied behavioral analysis work with the children themselves, preparing to move them both into community and school settings. And so we do a lot of research around not just sort of foundational aspects of 
how to serve children and work with children with neurodevelopmental differences, but also how to apply those types of things within schools. A second related area is the science of learning and human cognitive augmentation. So that's sort of where these two studies that I'm going to talk about today will sit. And really that's looking at using technological tools and tools in general to sort of increase the efficacy and efficiency of human learning and outcomes for students. And then sort of the thing that draws all three of the, or excuse me, those two areas together, the digital mental health, so thinking about access and accessibility um, within rural and urban environments where maybe they don't have um, access to mental health providers and things like that. And then that sort of science of learning and human cognitive augmentation is the development of digital technology. So thinking about like, you know, how do we leverage these really, what I consider to be very powerful tools to help students in almost any context you can imagine and how those con how those environments and contexts matter and what are ways that we can um, sort of work with them. So that's sort of the three areas and we have faculty that work within each of the three areas and then sort of the lab acts as a, as a focal piece for that. <clears throat> so really the lab is very it attempts to be very interdisciplinary. So we draw from a lot of different disciplines. And so we pull from social neuroscience, educational technology, you know, sort of the list goes on and on through there. And the idea is, is that we're trying to look at problems and solve these problems, not just as an educator, but more as a, a as a social um, impact and, and trying to help build those pieces that can create a sustainable change across a region or across a state or across, you know, I mean, ideally the nation. Um, so we, we try to pull lots of different disciplines together. And as you can imagine, you know, sort of everyone speaks a different language a little bit. It was uh, interesting. I had a conversation with a biochemist and she was talking to me about zebrafish behavior. And I was trying to relate it back for a, a neuroscience grant. And I'm trying to describe, well, I'm interested in human behavior. And so the language difference was really interesting to sort of kind of access and understand that she came at it with a very particular mindset and understanding of the world. And I was coming out with a different one and trying to negotiate what that meant. So we really do try to be interdisciplinary. We're always looking for uh, folks to, to work with. So some of the tools that we have in the laboratory are, you know, we have the neuroimaging. So we have a very, it's not as robust as say something like a um, fMRI or anything like that. Um, but these uh, functional neuro infrared spectrometer. And the idea is, is that we can take all of these tools into a classroom. So we have the laboratory setting. We have sort of what I would call a translational space where we have a mock classroom within the laboratory itself. And then the idea is eventually that we're able to actually go into a real classroom with real children and, and sort of not that the children in the lab and stuff aren't real, but you know, in an actual environment to work with the children and, and work with the teachers themselves. So the, the functional neuro infrared spectrometer will figure into the two studies that we're talking about today. And it's a really just a basic neuroimaging device. Uh, EEG, I'm sure you're familiar with, it looks at the electrical signals across the surface of the brain. We have other types of uh, measurement tools and um, computers to do cognitive modeling and to use for artificial intelligence processing and machine learning to automate some of these processes that we're going to look at today. Um, and then we really want to build up uh, multiple environments. So we're interested in building these sort of generative learning environments in the digital and using digital uh, tools such as VR, mixed reality, augmented reality, and thinking about how we could take some of the things that we learned in the laboratory and some of the tools that we have in the laboratory and place them out into rural and urban areas where maybe access to different types of opportunities are not necessarily as present. <clears throat> so the first study I'm going to talk with you today about it was published in Computers and Education and Artificial Intelligence. And what we're looking at is analyzing neurocognitive data via machine learning classification. And we'll get into some of what that means. But basically, the question that we're trying to answer with this is how can we use data in real time to predict what a student might do in a testing situation? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But if we start to think about, in general, and we saw this over COVID, there's some benefit, and I know people will dis may, may disagree with me about how much benefit or whether or not there is actually 
a whole bunch of benefits, but to being able to engage in online environments. It, from my perspective, particularly working in rural areas, that gives access to people who may not otherwise have access. And one of the sort of gold standards that we're looking to is within these synthetic environments, so think, uh, you know, online learning management systems, virtual reality, augmented reality, you know, sort of the list that we went through before is how to create adaptive environments. And so how do we individualize and create an environment that specifically addresses the needs of a particular learner in a particular place? And so there's been a lot of interest in this from the military all the way through the K-12 environments. And it, it makes sense because in almost in any context you can think of, education touches every discipline you can imagine. There, there is not one discipline that I can think of that education in some capacity does not touch on and it is not important. So we as educators really do need to be at the table for all at all of these different places to help lend our understanding to how we can interact and work with people. But what we're interested in specifically is how we can use these digital environments to teach. And so what pedagogies do we design and develop as we go and work in these different types of environments? So basically, when we start to look at it, you know, if you, you look through NSF's catalog, you look through other federal agencies, Department of Defense, they're spending large sums of money on trying to produce these environments, whether they're AI driven and machine learning driven or just understanding the data that we can derive for them. But the idea is and the value that I believe they see these agencies see in this is in the individualized learning components and increasing the efficacy and efficiency of that learning. So one example is I work with a company called Quantum Interface and they work with the Air Force to train or help develop training for pilots. So as you can imagine, a Air Force pilot is very expensive to train. They spend a lot of time training and the Air Force essentially wants to cut costs. And one of the ways they, they can cut costs is increasing the efficacy of the learning component. So one of the things that the Air Force pilots do is they have to do a lot of decision-making when they're flying. And that takes anywhere from 500 milliseconds, which is about what it takes to get a conscious thought. And then that doesn't even get into things like motor development and all that kind of stuff to, as they're flying to, to sort of make these decisions. So we look at peripheral eye tracking as a way to sort of do pattern identification for them and then allow them to implement decisions that they make in the cockpit much faster than what they would get otherwise. So we've gotten it down to about 100 milliseconds, 80 to 100 milliseconds for them to make a decision as they're engaging with it. And we can build confidence intervals around the peripheral eye movements and their gestures to understand how confident they are in the training component as they engage with these, these pieces. Now, you know, dropping a few hundred milliseconds doesn't seem like it would be that important initially for a pilot, but if we consider that as they're engaging, say, in, in enemy airspace or working with an enemy, that they have a, only a few hundred milliseconds to make a decision, that ability to understand and process and then make that decision and execute that decision, even losing a few hundred milliseconds means something to them. And so we've we've worked to decrease the, their time in, in the learning component and how effectively that they're able to make those decisions and recognize the different needs that they have. And that, I will admit that that's very skills-based in nature and it's a little different than we might get in a uh, educational context, but that's sort of the, the beginning of it. So as we think about these, these synthetic learning or these adaptive learning environments, our adaption can occur at a lot of places. So if you think about when you first install Windows, you know, it asks you a whole bunch of questions about like what you want, what colors do you want, how do you want things arranged, those kinds of things. That's adaption at one point. That's sort of at the front end of things. You put it in and then you kind of go from there. But what happens is if we think about even adaption as it occurs, as we're engaging with, say, an LMS or other types of environments, virtual reality, a lot of that stuff is retrospective in nature. And, and that's not a negative. It's just sort of where we are. And what I mean by retrospective is you sort of have to go through the process, then you respond to it, and then it makes the adaption. So it sort of happens after the fact. And, one of, and where that becomes a question is, what if we want to be able to do this as things are happening. So we often depend on a teacher to be flexible enough in the classroom to recognize what's going on, make adjustments on the fly, 
once they've made that adjustment on the fly, assess where the students are and just continue that process. So that's sort of, to me, the gold standard of what we're looking for in an adaptive artificial system is what is that teacher able to do that we can't using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so really the, the difficulty from a, a technical perspective using machine learning and artificial intelligence is assessing that student, that complex student cognitive state. Their, their cognitive states are very complex, very difficult to assess. And you know, if you think about from a research perspective, you know, we'll do things like talk aloud protocols, or we might do a, a test, or we might do some sort of cognitive survey or cognitive questionnaire or things like that. And those all gather information. But again, that's sort of after the fact. Or if we're actually engaged in some sort of activity, we stop the student, we may ask them a question, like, so for example, we may give them a math question, and then afterwards we may ask them, okay, you know, how difficult was that or how much work did you do in a, and what you're doing is you're breaking that primary cognition to assess the student, to ask them, okay, did this happen? The part of the problem is there's a lot of automaticity associated with cognitive action, and they're not always able to with reliability assess where they were in that. Um, Pasha Antonenko at the University of Florida has shown in a 2010 study that students are consistently have a very, very difficult time rating the amount of cognitive activity and cognitive work they have to do when they're engaging with content. And so those types of things um, become a question. So this gets us into, we're sort of looking at two types of data and what I call process data and product data. Now product data is sort of what we're all familiar with as, as educators. You know, we give a test, we maybe have them do a practical task, we have them write something, we analyze it, we look at it and we say, okay, you know, this is the lexical density, this is the complexity of writing. We make some assessments around and inferences around maybe the underlying cognitive reasoning that happens and those kinds of things. And that gives us a lot of good data and a lot of good research has come out of that approach. What I'm suggesting, we also layer in what I would call process data, which is the data that actually occurs as, or the information processing that actually occurs as the student is engaging with it. And why I think that that is important is if you look at sort of this figure here, you can see the fluctuations in cognitive demand as a student is reading for one minute. And that, I mean, that's a very short period of time. And you can see the amount of fluctuation that's happening uh, or the variability in it. And that's all variability we miss just looking at the product. So if you think about what we would look at as a product of a student reading, we might say, okay, well, here's their oral reading fluency, which is the number of words that they can correctly pronounce or say or read within one minute. And we get very little picture of maybe where there's areas of struggle are or what's going on sort of in between that time where we have the opportunity to talk with them and with what they're saying. And again, it's not to say that the product data isn't useful, it's extremely useful, but I'm suggesting we layer the two together and give us maybe a, a fuller picture of what we have. So the purpose of this particular study was to look at hemodynamic response. Hemodynamic response is just something that where as neurons and cognitive systems are engaged, there's a demand for oxygen. So the blood moves to those areas to provide oxygen. And we look at the oxygen, the ratio of oxygenation and deoxygenation of the blood due to, to neural demand as they're engaged with a particular uh, task and those and because the task is is say a problem solving task or those types of things we make the argument that that hemodynamic response is as a result of the engagement of problem solving in that particular task and and there's we can get into you know frameworks of why and what we think about how all that happens but for that in you know in this here we're just sort of looking at the hemodynamic response and so what we did is we took that hemodynamic response and the and the, it creates a, a pattern we get about you know, 12 to 15,000 data points for about 20 minutes of work, if that, for the students. And it creates a nice pattern, sort of a profile of what's occurring neurologically for that student. And then machine learning, particularly artificial neural networks are extremely good at classifying patterns. And so we, we wanted to be able to take those hemodynamic responses and then see if we could classify those patterns related to answer prediction on a content test. And so we had three different conditions. So we had um, the content area was specifically around the idea of DNA replication. So students were uh, 
uh, naive to that. They're ninth grade students. They had not yet had biology. They, you know, they may have had aspects of DNA replication in, you know, seventh grade and things like that, but not as in depth as they might get in, in their 10th grade work. And so we did uh, work on a television screen. We did work in virtual reality. And then we sort of did a null condition where they didn't have anything and they were just answering the questions. And these, um, the idea around the television screen, the virtual reality is, you know, the the television screen was basically what you would get in a video clip around, you know, learning on this particular content area. The virtual reality, and we were very careful to try to make sure it was relatively similar. The only thing the student could do was move around in a three-dimensional sort of way. They couldn't necessarily manipulate the content in the virtual reality. And that was intentional because we think that with the ability to manipulate, you might get some very significant differences simply due to the manipulation piece. And data was collected using an FNIR EEG and other types of psychophysio measurement tools, but we were really focused on the FNIR component of those things. So that hemodynamic response, the blood flow around the brain and the ratio of oxygenated to deoxygenated blood in the neural tissue. And sort of, so if we look at this, um, figure three shows where we were focused and where the initial um, sort of placement of the sensors were. So they were placed on the forehead, the prefrontal cortex. And we were curious about that because that has a lot more, there's a lot more happening, interesting things that happen educationally in that area versus other areas of the brain. Not that they're, we can't look at other areas, but those were the ones that were of most interest to us. Um, one of the things that we figured out is that that's pretty invasive. Um, not that we penetrate the skin or anything like that, but it, it's a lot for a student to have, you know, something on their forehead as they're engages. So we've tried to actively work to knock down the number of sensors. And we got it, depending on the student, between four and six sensors um, placed on the forehead, little circles, usually about maybe an inch or so across, a little bit less. Um, but the idea is, is to reduce that footprint of that sensor on the students as, as much as possible. Um, what you see down below is sort of the ordering of the blue, which would be the time frame for the content, followed by a question, followed by content, followed by question, and so on. So we directly asked afterwards, and that is a weakness. Um, I, I think one of the things that we would do had we had the opportunity to do the study over again is we would look at where placing the question you know, whether placing it right after the content or sort of down the line, what kind of role that plays. But we did not necessarily look at that in this study. Um, but it just gives you a sense they watched a, a 20 minute video or 20 minute VR or just had 20 minutes of blank with questions kind of scattered throughout. And then the question, like, so for example, at the three minute mark, there was content that related to that question that occurred at five minutes and so on down the line. So the samples we were looking at, 69th grade students, and they were randomly assigned to you know, one of the three conditions and generated about 12,000 data points per student. So the sampling rate of the FNIR is, I mean, relatively high. So you can get a lot of information over a short period of time about these particular con uh, pieces of content. So again, we're interested in the fluctuations and the variability that happens as they're engaged with the, that particular content and those questions. And so then what we decided to do is look at whether or not the content, the, the hemodynamic response from the content predicted whether or not they would actually be able to answer the content question. So keep in mind, this was completely, the, the whether or not they were the, the content question wasn't important in the sense that we were looking at that as the outcome. That was used to train the data, but we were looking to see if the actual engagement in the content using the neurological data could predict that piece. And that, it's, that gets a little sticky sometimes in, in that explanation. But we were looking basically to see, and this is just showing the sensitivity in that the fit, the forest model fit, did do what we wanted it to be able to do. And so this, we use confusion matrix and what we were able to come out with is within the video, you had about a 79% chance of correctly predicting a student's con answer on a content test. So keep in mind, that's completely independent of the actual question. It's simply what was the hemodynamic response while they were engaging with the content during the video. And 79% of the time we were able to look at that and say, yeah, they could answer the content question correctly and then show that that was the case. With the VR, it was uh, much higher, 87% of the time, and which um, 
is, is really interesting. We're not sure why. The, one of the things we think is probably it's related to the novelty of the VR. Um, most of the students weren't overly familiar with VR, and, so, and particularly in the learning context and things like that. So there may be some aspects of that going on. Uh, we probably need to tease that out a little bit more. Um, as you can see with the null condition where they didn't have any content, the, it wasn't predictive of answering a question. Basically, they got the question wrong is, is essentially what happened. And what we did do is we were curious to see whether or not this was simply a factor of the content itself, the, the science content, or could we apply it to other types of situations? So we looked at uh, reading a story, you know, were they able to answer questions about story? And that was, that was pretty good. And then we also looked at um, on the mental health side is dialectical behavioral therapy for students with trauma. And the reason we selected dialectical behavioral therapy is it's very skills-based in nature. And because it's skills-based, one of the ways we could sort of assess whether or not the student was making use of what they learned in the dialectical is they have to essentially select a correct strategy for a scenario when they're presented with it. And so they were able to do that. We were able to predict 81% of the time whether or not they would be effectively selecting the correct strategy to uh, engage with that particular scenario. So it, whatever we're looking at in terms of the hemodynamic response seems to be able to be classified with machine learning components and be predictive of what a student can do. So that that's something that we're interested. We think that that's a, a pretty important finding with that. And so now we start to think, well, what does this mean for us as we start to think about students in, in the classroom? and in, in kind of, So one way we think we can use this is assessing level of student involvement with the content. So, you know, sort of our reasoning goes that in order for them to be able to, you know, answer a question about content, they have to be engaged with the, con the content in some capacity. So somehow that piece, the, the percentage of ability to predict whether or not a student can you know, answer that question may get to some level of involvement with the content. You can call it engagement. You can call, I mean, there's probably lots of ways to describe it. Um, we also think it could be a way to validate new content. So picture you know, writing a curriculum or developing you know, content that you may want to present to students. And for some reason, it's not predictive of success on an outcome measure. Well, that means that could either mean one, your outcome measure needs to be adjusted or it could mean that maybe the content isn't aligned. And so there's some sort of disconnect occurring between the content that you're presenting to the students and how we're assessing those students. So we could think about ways about doing that. And then the other thing that we think that, you're, that we can do with this, if we can get the real-time processing, so taking that hemodynamic data, and I'm gonna show you a model of, of something that we're, we're working on, is we can evaluate whether or not students can assimilate this new content in real time. So as we're sort of reading, for lack of a better way, the neurological signals, we can, we can decide this looks like the students are sort of assimilating the information and making use of it, or no, they're not, we need to adjust. And so thinking about this, you know, Here's sort of where we go with this. Um, so you have your neurocognitive data input from the content. You classify it using machine learning and artificial neural networks. And then you can look at that. Once you classify the students, you can make predictions about, okay, are they moderate or low, moderate, or high in terms of their ability to respond to questions. Then we can start to change the content based upon that alignment. So keep in mind, we're, we're not cutting we're still assessing, but we're not assessing using the content questions. We're assessing using neurological data and that data can be garnered in real time. And that's the piece I think that's important. And so what we can start to do is if you think about the role that the teacher plays with the adaption of the content, well, we can have pools of content that are for moderate, low or whatever based upon topic. And we can have that content pulled and presented to the student. So if I'm going through this system and I'm having difficulty, well, maybe I need to adjust something within that my content. So maybe I need the reading level to change or maybe I need uh, to re review content or those kinds of things. So we can set up a system like this. And these uh, two little squid guys are uh, from a company I work with uh, called Squid Books. And what they've done is they do this without the automated piece, but they assess the students based on their success with the content. And then the student can actually adjust the reading level of the content as they're engaging with it. One of the things we're working with them on is using this type of, of this system 
to actually automatically adjust it based upon what the student's needs are. And so that the student doesn't have to necessarily assess their ability to say, read the words and say, okay, well, I need it easier. Well, how much easier? That's often hard for a student to answer. But if we have these types of classification pieces occurring, we may be able to do that in an automatic way. So that, that's where that machine learning and well, where the artificial intelligence comes in is that automated piece. Because the machine learning can classify and then that automatic piece of adjusting the content. So that was study one. So basically, you know, what comes out of study one is that we can use neurocognitive data to be classified by machine learning algorithms to predict student outcomes on a content test before they ever take the content test with some level of uh, accuracy um, compared to what they would do in real life. So that's sort of study one. Study two is related, but it, it goes at it from a certain, a slightly different approach. And this is really looking at mathematics cognitive demand for fifth grade students. And so one of the questions that, that we have is we have a lot of frameworks within education that try to assign levels of effort, levels of demand, levels of thinking to various types of uh, content question or uh, questions and, and tasks. And so the reason that becomes important is teachers often design their way that they present information to students based upon what they believe the demand and difficulty is of the content. So, you know, if you think about what a teacher does, a teacher doesn't walk in and start with, you know, the, the highest level difficulty item for the student. They often have to scaffold and move those pieces there. So based upon their understanding of the demand and difficulty, they sort of play out and, and plan lessons and movements across it, right? And so what we're looking at is we wanted to look at different cognitive demand across different mathematical tasks based upon how they were being assessed in mathematics. So we use the mathematical task frame, mathematics task framework, MTF, to sort of act as the guide. We made the assumption that the MTF was sort of the gold standard in this. And I, I, I'm not, I don't want to necessarily get into an argument about what you know the gold standard is, but we just sort of that's what we chose to, to work with. And one of our arguments was, and it comes back to that product and process data question again, is the way cognitive demand from a mathematics perspective is often done is we have, you know, we look at classroom activities and we look at teacher performance expectations and we say, yep, that's, that's more demanding or that's less demanding and we order based upon that. And that's fine, that's, that's again, not a problem, but that's sort of where we, we start. And so, Again, we come back to this idea that the way the teacher and the mathematics educators understand, we have to, they necessarily have to do it retrospectively. They, you know, again, if, if you're solving a math problem, I say, hey, stop, is this hard? I just, damp, you know, destroyed any primary cognitive process that the student was engaged with, right? So again, you miss the key fluctuations over the time of that student solving the problem. And more importantly, if you miss those fluctuations, you may not have a full picture of where the cognitive demand is derived. And we, I'll get into what that sort of means as we get through here. So if you look down here, if you, this is an example of cognitive demand in solving one math problem. And so this is starting from baseline where they have nothing all the way through being given the math problem through completing the math problem and then sort of coming back down. Um, and you can see there is a lot of fluctuation, even for that. Now, if you imagine that you have a 20 question math homework test, whatever, you get 20 of those graphs. And so you can you, you generate tremendous amounts of data and you get second to second, minute to minute understandings of where and what's happening. And then if you can tie that to things like eye tracking, or you can tie that, uh, so for example, eye tracking, we can have a good understanding of what the student is using from an information processing point of view. Or if you have heart rate variability, galvanic skin response, skin temperature, you can start to look at stress levels and how stress levels are interacting with that cognitive demand. Um, or if you want, we can do things, or, you know, there, there's any variety of combinations of that type of stuff. Um, you can even start to understand sort of some of the affective components like motivation, engagement, those types of things. So, and, and start to assess the levels of those things because you can get a very precise timing of what the student is doing 
and when they're doing it. And the nice thing is, and I'm probably gonna get in trouble for saying this, is in some ways it's more objective because you're looking at an autonomic response, which is not under the conscious control of the student. And so I'm not asking the student, what are you doing? I'm allowing sort of their physiological responses to dictate what's going on. Um, and, and there are problems with that. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that there are problems with that. Um, so this is the, the mathematical task framework, and this is sort of what we do. And you can see there's behaviors and sort of different components that happen, and you sort of use this rubric and you identify where the demand sits based upon different types of things. But for example, though, there, there does become a lot of judge, or not a lot, there becomes some aspects of judgment call in that, right? So looking at memorization and procedures without connection, right? Well, algorithmic in nature versus reproduction of learned facts and rules and formulas, they can they can look pretty similar, uh, particularly as a student starts a transition. So you may not actually know what's going on without sort of deeper understanding of, but this is sort of how, at least under the mathematics task framework, you would start to assess cognitive demand and order your items and, and things like that for uh, presentation to the students. <clears throat> So again, it comes back to this product and process data. Looking back at this sort of the mathematics test framework, a lot of this relies on sort of looking after the product after the fact and understanding what the student did. Now, again, if you were to take you know, some video, maybe as a student student, you can make some inferences around what's happening and, and why it's happening and those kinds of things. You could even go back and ask the student during the video, what were they doing? But in some of these aspects, so use of complex thinking, well, I, I can't imagine asking a third, a th third grader, did you use complex thinking to come to that answer? I mean, there's ways to get at that, but again, um, it, I think there's some sometimes some difficulty with that. And again, I'm not suggesting that we don't use this. What I'm suggesting is we layer it together with the pro process data and with this type of data. And so coming back to this question, thinking about the fluctuations, you know, we, this is reading, we saw what math looks like. So combining those two together. <clears throat> so the purpose of this work was really to look at how we can understand um, how data derived from neural cognitive methods can provide information, not just related to cognitive advance, because, you know, the argument can be that we're simply just rescaling the cognitive demand on just using some other measure, and, it, and it's sort of meaningless, and, and that's fine, you know, I, I don't make it, but also thinking about where the sources of cognitive demand come from. So one of the questions, and I, I think if you talk with teachers, teachers sort of know this instinctively or just through their sort of lived experience component, right, that cognitive demand in math isn't always derived from the math alone. There's reading that's going on, there's maybe distractions, you know, there's hundreds of other things going on that can create demand for that student that may have nothing to do with math or very little to do with math. So one of the things that we wanted to be able to do is sort of try to tease out the difference between those two. Is it coming from math or is it in the case of a word problem coming from reading? <clears throat> so we use an FNIR and this really shows you sort of how the FNIR itself works. So I know we talked about human dynamic data and FNIR data in the last study. Really what's happening is you have infrared light that's sort of shot through the skull um, and it reflects off of either oxygenated blood, deoxygenated blood uh, at two different wavelengths or it's absorbed by the surrounding tissue. And basically from that, the change in the wavelength, you can get the concentration of blood flow or excuse me, the concentration of oxygen in a given area and the more oxygen that's sort of being consumed at a faster rate, the more demand that is associated with that. And so that's how cognitive demand is sort of identified using an FNIR. And then we do analyses and, and visualizations to sort of, sort of show those pictures that you might associate with neuroimaging there. And so this is an example of some of the, the tasks that we used in the, uh, the study. And so you can see we have a memorization task, procedure with connection all the way through. And so the, you know, the, the levels of demand do, from an intuitive perspective do sort of match with, you know, this looks low and this looks high and these seem like these things would be, you know, of, of that nature. Um, and so this is sort of where, um, sort of where we went with this. Um, so we looked at fifth grade students and we one of the things we had to do in looking at this neurological data is that there's a few things. One, you have to sort of make sure that they're on level with math and reading, that that would make sense because you don't want the cognitive demand to be derived from something else that's going on. And the other piece that sometimes makes these types of studies difficult, 
is you have to do sort of a neurological assessment, a neuropsychological assessment of the student to understand if there's other things that may impact that. Um, you know, a, a great example is um, when I work with um, college students, for example, if they wear makeup over their forehead for some reason, that can impact that. So we have to check those kinds of things. If you drink caffeine, uh, sometimes uh, some medications, so ADHD medications will impact what you'll get for in terms of neurocognitive data and things like that. So there's lots of different things that can impact that. So you have to sort of do these screenings ahead of time to make sure that the students are um, able to be within the study and, and have reasonable stuff. So what we did is we, after we took that data, we did an analysis. And one of the things that came out is that the MTF or the task framework really isn't off in how it rates cognitive demand. And, and I think that makes sense because when you look at the different tasks, yeah, okay, it, it would make sense. So the neurological data and the MTF data did align. But when we started to look at regions of interest in areas associated with mathematics processing or reading processing, where the demand was centered was different. And that's the piece I think that gives us a little more insight into what's happening. And so this is sort of more what you, you would expect to see. So think of orange as less happening, like there's less demand occurring around that less blood flow. Yellow is very intense. And so when you look at where and start to um, compare from a uh, demand perspective where the majority of demand is located, you can start to see where, whether it's tied to reading or whether it may be tied to um, mathematics processing. And so these types, of th these types of things are what we use. Now, this is just a visualization. This is not the actual data. So what happens in the background is you have all of the sort of second to second readings occurring. These are actually composite images of all the students over time and sort of just to show what we were able to see with all of that. <clears throat> and so what we found from that is that the intensity of cognitive demand and what we see in the um, mathematics test framework and the neuroimaging align, um, which is great. I, I think that's that's a very positive thing. Um, but we were able, once we started to break apart the moment to moment and real time responses, we could start to see and we could tease out whether they were reading or whether they were doing math, whether they were reading, whether they were doing math and the intensity of the underlying process that was engaged as they were in, as they were working with those processes. So, you know, was the reading real, real intensive and the math sort of to the side or vice versa? <clears throat> So with that, what we did not see, and this was this was hard to tease out, but it's um, we didn't see simultaneous activation. What we saw was sort of these fluctuations in activation, and that makes us think that there's sort of independent processing components associated with math and reading. Now, I know there's discussions of you know reading numbers and and doing those kinds of things but the the underlying mathematical operations versus the reading operations is sort of what we're talking about um and so we see sort of these separate pieces so the question becomes okay well what does that mean and you know the the answer is we're still sort of working it out and this is our thoughts but i would love to hear others thoughts on this as well is you know maybe we start with initial isolation of the mathematics and the reading component and then move where we're layering them together in some way um, and teaching very explicitly what to attend to and what not to attend to for the child as they're as they're working with the different types of words and things like that i think that you know lends some discussion of that and i think the other thing that that dis that that causes us to think about is teachers elementary teachers at least in the context of say, really do need to think about reading when they're doing mathematics problems with their students. You know, so for example, if a, if a child has, let's say, it has a learning disability related to reading, well, and we wanna test math, maybe we need to lower the level of the reading level so that they can focus on the math. Or, you know, maybe vice versa, you know, it really depends, but the, the point is, you know, in teaching math, we can't just say, okay, well, let's forget about reading. It, it, we're doing math right now. And I think this may even have, though the study is only on elementary kids, so I want to be clear, I think this does have some implications as you start to think about middle school and high school students, because we become much more siloed as we teach 
you know, so for example, I think of like a high school teacher teaching algebra one, I can guarantee you he or she doesn't probably even think about reading as, as an issue. Or if they do, it's only because maybe there's an IEP or something that they have to sort of think about and they're, they're required to think about. But in reality, it, it's much more integrated than what we necessarily do is at the middle school and high school level. So I think, you know, then we can get into some discussions around what to do with this. And this is actually a system we have in the lab now, and it, it uses an iPad and some neurocognitive and psychophysical measurement data capture. And so if we can understand the levels of demand, right, and we can classify those levels of demand to low, moderate, and high, the teacher can look at a display of a green student, yellow student, red student. Well, what happens if, you know, and we've only done this with 12 kids, so we're not like, you know, at a full class size yet and has to do with some of the technical areas we have some difficulty with. But, you know, what do we do when the class is all red? Well, maybe the teacher does need to stop, go back, and then work with the students until maybe they're all yellow or green. Um, one of the other things that we get asked about a lot is, you know, what's the level of demand you need? And that that's a great question and a question we want to answer. We don't know exactly. So, you know, if the demand is too low, they're bored. Demand is too high, they give up. So there is sort of that sweet spot, but I couldn't tell you exactly what that sweet spot is. And I, it may be that it's sort of there for each individual student. So my sweet spot is different than, you know, my wife's sweet spot or, you know, whatever. And so when we start to think about those demand pieces, maybe we can individualize instruction to hit that spot. And I, and I don't know. I mean, these are all just thoughts that we have, but this is something that we have students in, or excuse me, with teachers in the lab, and we actually have them adjust based upon what they're seeing for the students. Um, so that's just sort of those pieces there. Um, I think I hit my time 45 minutes and thank you all very, very much. I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to hear me out. And I will say this, we're always looking for collaborators. So if you're interested in this and you know, you're know, you always welcome to come visit or you know work, work with you know whatever, and you know, please feel free to contact me. So I'm gonna stop sharing and then I think you might have questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you so much for that presentation, like truly fascinating. Um, so many cool implications that came out of it. We did have one question from our director, Julie Spickla. Are you examining the teacher's fluctuations as well? That's a great question. So we have started doing that. We um, did a neural coupling study or inner brain coupling. And what we were looking at with that is basically as a teacher and student are interacting with one another, there is a predictive response that occurs in either the student's brain or the teacher's brain related to specific cognitive systems that are activated. And depending on which systems are activated, it actually relates to how well somebody is understanding something. And so we're looking at fluctuations in that respect, like how well is the teacher understanding the student and vice versa. We have not looked at fluctuations in teachers in terms of sort of this, the demand on them as they're teaching, if that makes sense. Thank you. We do have a question from question mark. I don't know who that is. Hands up. I have my hand up. Oh, okay. Ken, what's your question? I have a question. Uh, do you think we're going to a more biological empirical data on how well the brain is working rather than a Sigmund Freud style that's been in uh, vogue for 100 years. We're going to a more biological basis for understanding learning. That That's a great question. I I would like to say yes. I mean, that, but that's my perspective. I, I know sometimes there's an antagonism, I think, between this idea of biological aspects of learning versus social aspects of learning versus, and, and there really shouldn't be. I, I think um, in a lot of ways they, they work together and, and because ultimately we wanna understand the whole child and the biological action gives you one sort of lens to look through. And I, and I think it's an important lens. I mean, I personally devote quite a, quite, ugh, quite a bit of time to understanding that. Um, and, you know, in my opinion, I think it gives me some 
I, I would consider them more objective sort of views of things from a physiological perspective. And I think, and, and again, I think this can be a discussion. So I, I want to be clear on this, but because human physiology is sort of universal for lack of a better way to say it, like, you know, there's, there's different tolerances and things like that for, um, you know, how much blood can flow around the human brain or how quickly it can do that kind of stuff. Um, it gives us a little bit of ability to talk more generally about people than it, you know, and, and, and there can be some positives associated with that. Um, I, I see some questions and I, I, I know there's some other questions. So let me see if I can answer the first. Okay. So the question is, you know, uh, what are the students reactions? So uh, they are extremely excited and, and usually what we do before we go into the classroom and actually do the study about two or three weeks beforehand i'll bring the fnir in and um usually the teacher is really happy to have this because i'll give a whole lesson on it we'll hook the students up to it show them what it looks like um if they bring in a flash drive when they're first learning about the fnir we can we can actually give them videos of their brain processing uh we hold meetings for the parents because as you can imagine when we start to take this kind of data sometimes parents get nervous about it too and so um, it, it truly, truly has to be a partnership with the school and working with the school and the parents so that they can understand sort of the value and why we're doing this. Um, I, I think, you know, minus, you know, without that interaction, I, I think it would be a very difficult time convincing both the students and the parents of this. Um, age of the student affects the activity of the brain. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, I cannot, I, this is from Allison. Uh, how does the age of the students affect the activity in the brain? So I, I think it does. And so one of the um, aspects that we find is um, that age does play a role in the amount of demand and things like that. So as they develop other processes associated with, um, you know, with math or, you know, underlying cognitive processes, the level of demand and the amount of how things flow changes and it, it can impact that so you know i haven't had the opportunity to sort of do a longitudinal aspect and i i don't know what that would look like i'll, I'll be very honest with you in that um you know most of my stuff is sort of a uh, almost a cross-sectional or, or snapshot of that particular student of those students at that particular time i will say in general we try to keep the ages right around you know a, a you know a, a typical age say for a fifth grader and things like that so we do a lot of screening on the front end to make sure that we have sort of these uniformity of of sample and things like that i think someone had their hand up but i don't um and i apologize i, I missed who it was it was uh our julie Swickla. it's okay yeah uh, rich i will i will probably email you and, and chat with you some more we're we're okay. actually doing some very similar work right now um, oh. i'm working with jack shelley tremblay okay. um, to do work with three four and five year olds or with around their fair sharing and content uh fractional content knowledge oh wow uh, so okay. we're really focused on you know very narrow content area but we we are using the toby glasses as of as okay. of this August, I guess, collecting data. So anyway, I have lots of shop to talk with you. So I'll, I'll I would love to love to talk with you, Julie. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much. This was just terrific for our students to see. I really appreciate your time. It's fantastic. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, any other question? We had a, a question of, um, about how learning or attention deficit disorders could affect these studies. And I also thought as an addition to that, when you were talking about your last study, how useful this could be for English language learners. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll start with the, the attention deficit disorder and things like that. Um, they do very much affect outcomes in these studies. Um, it, it's really interesting. You can very clearly, um, and this will probably make me sound bad, my son has ADHD. And so I've hooked him up to the machine to, uh, to, to look at what it looks like when he's doing things versus others. And this is all anecdotal. I've never sat down and analyzed the data. And I, um, we actually screen children out with, with attention deficit disorder only because um, if, if you're looking at sort of neurotypical folks versus uh, with children with neurodevelopmental differences, it can radically change what you're seeing. We are in the process of setting up an ABA clinic out of the laboratory to specifically look at children with neurodevelopmental differences, but that we haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, but I, I think that that is an important area and it is important to understand both what's the same and sort of what some of the differences are. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And the other question was about um, 
tool for, oh yeah, for English language learners, yes. So uh, while I was at the University of Buffalo, we did have someone look at um, English language learning and how um, demand changed as someone became more able to work with their L2 and things like that. And so what you do start to see is you can start to see where when they're initially engaging in, in the learning of a new language, you get this rapid, rapid rise in sustained difficulty. But as like, if you were to track them sort of over time, and as you track them over time, that average demand actually decreases. So you can start to talk about, and what, what you see from a behavioral point of view is they're able to engage in more conversation, but that drop off in demand actually happens before they may show from a behavioral perspective. Um, but you know that's that's sort of what we see with with that, if that makes sense. That's very cool. Um, we have a couple questions. I'm assuming it's from Maria Wallace. Is that right? <laughs> She's one of our faculty in the center. Um, for some of our graduate students getting started with writing RB applications, can you talk uh, in more depth about how you think about your approach to gaining participant and caregiver consent? Yes. So I. I Okay, so I guess from an IRB perspective, um, I'll start with that. I often have to argue, because the first thing they want to do is put me over in sort of a medical IRB. Um, and I'm like, well, no, it's it's not medical in the sense that universities see medical IRBs, if that makes sense. It, it's really a social science IRB. Now it's more invasive than say a typical, um, you know, social science IRB, but in reality, nothing we use penetrates the skin there's no body fluids there's no you know nothing like that like it's not we don't have to take uh, to, to give you a great example they maybe put a sharps container in my lab and i've never once used anything that required a sharps container i'm like it just sits there and i have it in there because when they want to look at it they, they got to see it in there um so that, that's sort of you know that that's where it's because people hear neuroimaging and they hear you know heart rate variability they automatically think some sort of penetrating the skin and things like that and I'm, I'm very careful in the sensors i choose that we don't have to do those kinds of things now with that said um it does go beyond say a typical you know what would happen in a classroom so there is a lot more detail that i have to put in and usually that detail is a lot is right around um how i'm going to sort of get consent and assent from the child and what does it look like when they're uncomfortable? So um, what we tend to do is we try to err on the side of caution. So, um, and, I, and I'll give you a great example. We were working with a four-year-old in virtual reality and looking at some things and they just sort of froze up and they weren't crying, they weren't upset, they weren't doing anything, but they froze. And immediately we took it off. And just then after that, the tears started. And so, you know, that's an example of where, you know, the. It was, she wasn't verbalizing anything, but it was clear that there was an issue. Um, so the same kind of things with the sensors is, you know, as I'm placing the sensor on the child, as I'm doing things, I'm always asking the child, you know, is this okay? You know, I'm gonna put this around your head if it's too tight, you know, and constantly just having that communication with that. That's incredibly important. And being able to convey that in the IRB is important. Um, from a parent perspective, um, we actually will hold a parent night or, or multiple parent nights to invite them in to see the equipment um, because the parents are often concerned about the type of data because their first question is why does someone in education need this kind of data basically you know why should i give you my child's emotional data or physiological data how is it going to be used what's going to happen with it um, the other thing when you start to think about um your IRB with these types of tools is you generate tons of data. I mean, I'm, I'm talking more data than, you know, I, I mean, I have data that I'm still going through. And yes, <laughs> I see Julie. Yes, Julie, absolutely. Um, and thinking about how to store that, access it, and make sure that it's de-identified and all that kind of stuff. Um, we use, what uh, it's not Red Hat. Um, we basically use a HIPAA and FERPA compliant server. Uh, we add that extra layer in there, not because we have to, not because it's actually medical data, but it tends to make both the IRB feel better and the parents feel better that it's it's secured that way. That makes a lot of sense. It is 102, so I want to be sensitive to everybody's time. If you need to hop off, you can. Rich, do you have time to just answer these last couple of questions? Sure, or? I'm sorry. Absolutely. 
No, no, you're fine. Um, I think uh, this is also Maria um, related to supporting students who may want to pursue similar interdisciplinary research. Can you discuss how you juggle all the ideas, avenues of action items, and so on? That yeah. I mean, it's really awesome what you do, and having, like you said, all these different players come to the table in the lab is amazing. So, how do you do all that? Yes. Uh, so I think there's a couple things that I tr that we collectively tried. Number one, um, it, it's always a collective decision. Um, I, I, I'm sure those of you that have been around the faculty know it's like trying to herd faculty to get them to do something if they don't want to do it. Um, it. It's like herding cats. So it, it always has to be a collective decision, number one. But then number two, um, when I was first starting out as a, as a professor, um, a neuropsychologist I worked with, because I kept trying to learn what she was doing and what the computer science people were doing. She's like, stop you're going to drive yourself insane trying to be an expert in all these different areas you just you can't do it and so you have to respect the expertise that people bring to the table you know so when i'm working with a computer scientist for example i can understand aspects of what they do but i don't know to the level that they do and i just have to sort of respect the fact that they're good at what they do and you know they they can do it so that that's number one i, I think that respect piece is important but number two i do try to be open to understanding that you know the methods and approaches and ideas and thoughts i have are not always shared by the people that i may be working with they may have a different lens different you know different thought process and so hearing those pieces is incredibly important and, and comes down to really just that communication piece. And, you know, I, like I said, I think back to just a few days ago, talking to that person about the zebra fish. Um, you know, she, she was very passionate about zebra fish. I, I think that's great. I don't share that passion, um, but, you know, she was very passionate, very knowledgeable about that. And so trying to kind of translate between my understanding, because I'm like, well, I work with children. She's like, well, I work with zebra fish. I'm like, well, is there similarities? You know, what is it that you do? Like, how, you know, why do you work with zebra fish? You know, those kinds of things. And so sitting and understanding. And, and when I first came to ECU, the first thing I did when I first, when I set up the laboratory, I literally went around to different people that I thought I might be interested in working with and just said, hey, do you want to get coffee? I want to hear about what you do and understand what you do. Um, those are all important pieces. That's all really great advice for our students. Um, I see someone has a question about the enhanced through biofeedback. I yes. So the short answer is yes. Um, in the on the counseling side of things, um, we do a lot of biofeedback, and I tend to conceptualize counseling as sort of education of a person around mental health concerns and maybe even their themselves. And so using biofeedback to help that it, it does work. Um, one of the most common actually uh, biofeedback things I've seen in learning is around ADHD. So they'll have a usually a, a small EEG. <clears throat> and as they're trying to teach a child to sort of focus and reduce the level of um, activity associated with what's going on from an ADHD perspective, you have a, a like a flock of birds on the screen and it'll, they'll all be moving around in different direction. And as they focus and learn how to sort of um, deal with their um, ADHD, they're able to bring coherency to the flock and get it moving in uniform directions. And what that does is that teaches them that, you know, for example, when we're working on a math problem or those kinds of things, how to actually take advantage of that process. So biofeedback can play a huge role in that type of thing. Uh, I just have I one last question. When you were first sure. talking, just um, I was thinking about like gauging the students' understanding or cognition as they're processing things. I wonder if that eliminates the the use of failure as a learning tool because they can kind of correct automatically, or can does that play a role in there? What do you? Have? Yes, that's a great question, and so I think. So in this study we did where we were looking at sort of predicting student outcomes ahead of time, you know, the, the thing I love to say is, well, we don't ever have to give them a test again, right? And that that's not true, though. <laughs> um, you know, and so the I think if we replace the idea of failure with a sort of productive struggle, for lack of a better way to say it, that's right. still present regardless of you know, whether or not we're collecting it in process or sort of waiting to the end. I think the advantage is if you think about what we use failure as a learning tool for, at, you know, is it's it's really to look at, okay, 
how did the teacher sort of do instruction? But then where are the areas that the student may need additional help? Mm. You know, so where do we bring extra content or extra scaffolding in for that student? And so the only thing we're doing is instead of maybe looking at it retrospectively, we're capturing the failure as it's happening, for lack of a better way to say it, I think might be sort of how I would look at that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Awesome. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time because I know we've already gone over time, but I appreciate you so much and thank you for thank joining you. us today. And I'm thank you. I appreciate the invitation. Great. All right. Um, Have a great day. Hey, y'all.